right, Danny Parkins is here, one of the best radio hosts in Chicago. The best. I don't know that many, so I'm just going to say the best. Um, what's going on, man? Good to have you on, Kevin. And, uh, I'm good to be on your show. Wait, whoa, wow, whoa. I'm very confused. I mean, come on. You can't- I do that sometimes. I do that sometimes. At the end of an interview, I'll be like, thanks. Hey, man, thanks so much for coming on. I once- Or I'll do, or I'll do, I'll call this Slow News Day, which I've done many times, or I'll say this show when I mean Slow News Day. I once said to a, to a guest at the end of an interview, all right, man, how you doing? <laughs> so it's, it's it's actually very similar I don't know if you've ever done this where you're, you're like talking to your wife or whatever and then reflexively the next person you'll sign off with like i love you or like something like that and you're like you're talking to like yeah i'm talking to like jason gallagher yeah. Yeah. have a good flight you too yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. that's so yeah. stupid take, take, take luck yeah that whole thing yeah um all right so we are 12 days until the chicago bears change their portions forever I'm going to quickly recap how I feel about the Chicago Bears situation. Okay. Everybody that I, and I said this on your show last week, but I'll say it to, to our audience too, because they weren't locked in to uh, to Chicago Radio. Or they were, or they were. But um, Caleb Williams has the ceiling to be a franchise changer. And everybody who has a cynicism that's like, well, the Bears screw everything up. That's why you take Caleb Williams and you change everything. Franchise changing quarterbacks change everything. And it reminds me, like, the only way out of it is good players. Because they've missed on a bunch of coaches in a row. They've missed on a handful of GMs in a row. The fan base is trained to, and I'm not saying Ryan Poles is a miss. I'm just saying going back a bit. Um, the fan base is trained to think the worst of the quarterback position by now. And I think that, and I've compared this to recruiting before, where like after like four cycles of recruiting, following college football recruiting, I stopped caring about individual players because I, I had just gotten so excited over guys who just didn't matter. And I think if you're a Bears fan right now, if you're 25 years old, you've been excited about Trubisky and it's burned you. You've been excited about Justin Fields and it burned you. The only way out of this culture is with a franchise changing quarterback. Bears fans 12 days out feel what, Danny Parkins? They're coming around. They're ready to fall in love. They're ready to fall in love again. But you're right. They've been scorned many, many times. I mean, so I'm 37 years old. The debate, so I was not alive for the 85 Bears. Right. The the debate of my lifetime of who the best quarterback in franchise history is oh, God. is like a Jay Cutler, Eric okay. Kramer. It is Jay Cutler. Yeah. Yeah. That that is the who is the third name you were gonna say? Justin Fields. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh my God. I really like Justin Fields. I'm just if that's but they're getting rid of him and they're not signing him to a second deal. Like that's, but they got rid of, but him. They're, but then someone could be listening and be like, okay, but, but you're 37. You don't know history. Yeah. You haven't seen it. Okay. The bears are the only franchise in NFL history to never have a 4,000 yard passer. Right. They're the only franchise in the NFL to never have a 30 touchdown passer. So bears fans come by the cynicism. Very honestly, But I do think that while it's less in the NFL because of fantasy and gambling and there's so few Mm -hmm. games that you can watch the games on national TV, I do think we sometimes underestimate as sports media how many people just watch their team or just Mm -hmm. know about their team's history. And so what I've been trying to tell people is like before Patrick Mahomes, yeah, the Chiefs had success Mm -hmm. with Alex Smith and with Trent Green and with Joe Montana, but the Chiefs hadn't won a single game, one regular season game with a quarterback that they had drafted before Mahomes since Todd Blackledge. <laughs> Every other quarterback that they won a game with, they, Brody Croyle, 0 and 10. Every yep. other quarterback that they drafted never even got onto the field. So it was always other teams. Guys, the Bengals were the bungles before Joe Burrow came along. Mm-hmm. So, like, you would have to actually believe in goblins and ghosts and that the laundry is cursed if you really think that Chicago can't have a great quarterback just because Chicago hasn't had a great quarterback. I'm running through. This is what I was doing typing while you were talking. All great points. I'm looking at bleak 4,000-yard passers. Ryan Tannehill did it in back-to-back years with the Dolphins. (laughs) With the Dolphins' Ryan Tannehill who they eventually rode out of town had back-to-back 4,000 yards. Joe Namath like did that, it. 
I think Trevor, not to say, like Trevor Lawrence did it last year, and there's all sorts of discourse on Trevor Lawrence. And he just sort of, like Derek Carr does it all the time. Um, uh, Kirk Cousins does it all the time. CJ Stroud obviously did it last year. I mean, there, there's there's some John Kitna. Yeah, uh, Kerry Collins. K- like 2002 Kerry Collins. What a throwback. Yeah, so anyway. These are point low being, bars, man, is the point. These are <laughs> low bars. These are low, low bars. 2016 Eli Manning, who we love, did it. And he was temporarily benched like the next season. It's the type of thing where... Caleb Williams has a better than 50-50, maybe around 50-50 shot to set those records his, year one. his rookie year. By Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, it's a 17-game season. He's got Keenan Allen and DJ Moore and a above-average offensive line, and they added DeAndre Swift and Cole Komet, and we can get into all of that. But we saw Justin Herbert have 31 touchdowns mm-hmm. as a rookie. We saw Andrew Luck have 4,300 passing yards as a rookie. And Andrew Luck, had, he took over 40 sacks. He had 18 picks. Mm-hmm. It's not like there are no mistakes, but being a playmaker, being a multiplier, being a game-changing talent like you're talking about, you can produce if you are in even a decent situation. No one would have said C.J. Stroud was in a good situation last year. This is a great situation, an unprecedented situation for a number one pick. I think at least one, if not both of those records fall year one. All right. So the point of this episode, Danny, is like what happens to the Bears post Caleb Williams? The moment they take Caleb Williams, we'll adapt to the franchise. We'll start here. How close are they? Like how close are they in a changing NFC North, which is extremely different from a year ago because we know now what Jordan Love is. Kirk Cousins is out of the division. Um the Lions made the NFC title game and they seem to only be getting better because they're still a young team. Like how close are the bears to winning an NFC North title the moment they take Caleb Williams and then whoever they take it at nine. So I'm not a Homer. I'll bet against the bears. Like it's nothing, but I absolutely think it's in play that the bears could win the division this year. And I like the lions. I picked the lions to go to the super bowl before the year last year it's it's a tough division when you were on my show I asked you how close the NFC North was to being the toughest division in football so I don't think it's a cakewalk but people just need to remember and I know know you know this this isn't the Bears number one pick it's Carolina's they won seven games last year they were playing better the second half of the year than the first half of the year they have difference making players at all three levels of the defense Jalen Johnson at corner Tremaine Edmonds and TJ Edwards at linebacker, Montez Sweat on the defensive line, good young players in the secondary with Tyreek Stevenson and Kyler Gordon and Jaquan Brisker, a defensive head coach in Matt Eberflus. They should be a top 10 defense in the NFL. And if a few things break right, and maybe if they use the ninth overall pick on the final piece, maybe they can be a top five defense in the NFL. That's pretty useful for a quarterback. And then on offense, you know, all the names, we just talked about it. So We see teams jump from seven wins to 11 wins all the time, literally every year in the NFL. And the Bears have upgraded significantly at wide receiver two and QB one. Those are pretty big positions to upgrade. And we don't know what's happening with the ninth pick. So imagine if it's Roma Dunze or Mm -hmm. Joe Alt and they have go from a good left tackle or an average left tackle in Braxton Jones to a great one. So I do think it's in play that they win the North this year, but I think that they the goal will be to be in a Super Bowl within the timeline of Caleb Williams' rookie contract. Okay, so all that is great. You mentioned the last piece, maybe on defense being at nine, maybe Joe Alt on offense, uh, maybe Roma Dunze, yeah. maybe any of those receivers who slip. If you're Ryan Poles at nine and you have your pick of most of the guys who are available to be mocked at nine – where are you going on that, defense or offense? Offense. He has given Matt Eberflus plenty. His first two draft picks uh, as GM were second-round picks in the secondary. He passed on Jalen Carter for Darnell Wright. He drafted Tyreek Stevenson. He signed, you know, he traded for and then signed Montez Sweat. He gave Jalen Johnson massive money. They spend more on the defensive side of the ball than the offensive side of the ball. He used high picks in Zach Pickens and Javon Dexter. He has given him a ton of capital on the defensive side of the ball. When he got hired, he said, remember where I came from when talking about roster building. Kansas City, weapons, weapons, Mm -hmm. weapons. That was a team that it didn't work, but they used a first-round pick on Clyde Zelaire when they definitely had more needs on the defensive side of the ball than the offensive side of the ball. 
he knows that he needs to support his quarterback with a ton of talent so that he can maximize that rookie deal. And Keenan Allen, he was amazing last year, but he is 32. That is past the threshold of when wide receivers drop off in production. Adam Thielen's the only receiver who had over 500 yards at 32 years of age or older last year. I don't think Keenan Allen's going to fall off a cliff, but obviously he's not a long-term answer for the Bears. So I think the goal would be Malik Neighbors or Romo Dunze if one of those two falls. And then I think the former offensive lineman, Ryan Poles, would just add another great lineman, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's Joe Alt or the kid from Washington, Fashano. Uh, no, uh, Olu Fashano is the kid from Penn State. Excuse oh, me, Fatano. Penn State. Yeah, I keep flipping those guys around. Um, but I, I will be very surprised and disappointed if Ryan Poles does not use that asset to get another blue player for the offensive side of the ball. Hmm. Okay. Um, who is the biggest threat in the NFC North? The Lions. To that. To the, it, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I point. mean, it's the Lions. I, they, they're really good. And Ben Johnson keeps coming back. <laughs> I, I wanted the Bears to fire Eberflus and hire Ben Johnson to kind of do what the Cubs did, like hire Craig Council away from the Brewers, weaken your biggest rival, and strengthen uh, the local team. But Wait, five seconds on that. Is that working out? I saw a thing of the day that's not working out as well as people thought. The Brewers, it may be. There's maybe a Ewing theory thing with Craig Council. Uh, yeah, Bre Brewers are doing very well. It's early. Chicago is very happy to have Craig Council. So th okay. there, there's your okay. five seconds. And they haven't played yet. So I, I'm confident the Cubs okay. will be looking down at the Brewers in the standings. But I digress. Uh, but that was my idea. I was like, you can't possibly tell me that you have Caleb Williams and the best coach that you could possibly hire in the world to develop him is Matt Eberflus. Like, that's just an impossible argument to make. So – I would have fired him to open up the search to go after Harbaugh, to go after Ben Johnson, et cetera. But the Lions roster building, every single player that Brad Holmes has drafted is still on the team. Mm -hmm. That is a crazy stat. And so they just seem to be very good at this. But I do think, you know this, it's a quarterback league. How long are we from Caleb Williams being better than Jared Goff if Caleb Williams is what he's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Two years? Mm -hmm. Two years? Probably. So maybe less. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned the rookie or the the Bears franchise. What I, I I honestly, if if I've seen the Bears franchise records, I don't want to see their rookie records. But if you want to talk about the uh, the Bears franchise records following this year, like if he gets there, he's maybe Goff in year one. Right. And I would listen, what CJ Stroud did last year with having basically, you know, single digit interceptions yeah. and all of that production, that's crazy for, for a rookie. Like I assume Caleb is going to have some fumble problems, but the guy doesn't put the ball in harm's way through the air. He's crazy productive. He's crazy talented and he's walking into an amazing situation. So I think the lions, because of their roster building, because of their continuity, because of the obvious strengths of their offensive line, they are the biggest threat. They deserve to hold that title. I know people will put Green Bay in front of Chicago, but I think those two teams are on a similar tier. And then I respect the hell out of Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota, but what are they doing at quarterback? So I would rank it Detroit, Chicago, and Green Bay on the same tier, and then Minnesota bringing up the rear for now. I, I do want to agree with you on the Matty Berflus point. I look at it this way. If a coach, I, I, I after year two, year three, I think every owner should bring in their coach and say, what have you done? What's your best case for keeping this job? Because it's year to year after it, once you've had two years for me, it's year to year. Like there's no earned credit on this thing. The, the Patriots just fired Bill Belichick, by the way, right. a couple months ago, right. just FYI, little FYI. And that's the thing about the Eagles is like, Oh, Nick Sirianni made the Super Bowl. Well, guess what? The Eagles have fired a lot better coaches than Nick Sirianni, a lot better. And people are like, well, he made the Super Bowl last year. Wait till you find out what the other guys did. What did you find out what Andy Reid did? What did you find out what Doug Peterson did? Anyway, uh, I don't want to get into that stuff. But, like, I don't know, and I don't want to harp on this thing, but, like, what's Eberflus's best case? He didn't – I don't think he, he hired the offensive staff befitting of Justin Fields. I feel like they stuck with that way too long. Um, I just didn't see a proof of concept that he's going to be, once Caleb Williams takes off, and I think he will, he's going to be the guy that's going to be here for 10 years. So I agree with you. Um, not only did he not hire the right offensive coaching staff for Justin Fields, but there was some scandal on his coaching staff last year with Alan Williams. Oh, I remember le that. leaving in a shroud of secrecy. And did we? Did anything ever? Did we ever find out what happened there? 
not that would rise to the level of journalistic standards to say on, sure, to okay. say on okay. this is football, right. you know, but it was moving on. it was not great behavior. Um, okay. And running backs coach, similar situation weeks yeah, later, yeah. leaving in controversy and scandal and secrecy. And so the argument is Ryan Poles and the players seem to love him as a leader culture, leadership, accountability, open line of communication. He has a leadership council on the team that he meets with every week and he takes feedback. I know Jalen Johnson decently well. He comes on the show every week. They have not always seen eye to eye, Eber Flus and Jalen Johnson, but he re- he will say like, coach listens to us. He empowers us. And that gets a lot out of him. Montez Sweat came over from Washington, obviously a very dysfunctional situation, and immediately talked about how it was so very clearly different here in the locker room and in the meetings and with the coaching staff than it was in Washington. And he didn't really know from afar what he was walking into. So the players, especially on the defensive side of the ball, have endorsed the culture that Matt Eberflus has created. But how long does that last? When does the the hits principle that he loves to talk about so much, like when does that wear thin and you need a difference-making X's and O's offensive coach to maximize a quarterback? Hopefully Shane Waldron's it. I would have gone for Ben Johnson. Why should you bet with Caesar Sportsbook? Two words, Caesar's rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesar's can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. I'm so old and out of it. I had to look up what year it was. It's 2024. So it's 2027 and we're doing this show. Yeah. We're three years into ESPN Omaha's nine-year deal. We got six more years left on it. Thanks for having me back, by the way. Of course. Um, 2027, we're doing this show. Who's better? Love or Caleb Williams? Caleb. 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 It has to be Caleb. Now, what part of my brain, I always say everybody has biases. The only people you can trust are the people who admit the biases. Now, what, <laughs> now what, now what part of my answer is that we border Wisconsin here in Chicago. My dad's <laughs> family is from Wisconsin and that they have never in their life, people my age and older, not known a quarterback that either was for sure a first ballot Hall of Famer, or right now they believe that Jordan Love has a shot, maybe not the first ballot, but he'll get there too. Part of it is motivated by I just don't believe they could be that damn lucky and go three for mm-hmm. three like no other team has well, done before. I, I will I will say this. The lack of an owner leads to a type of patience that most franchises cannot have at the quarterback position. It it's true it's true. Um, but I don't think it was a mistake to play CJ Stroud right away. And I don't think it was a mistake to play uh will be a mistake to play Caleb Williams right away. And yes. Patrick Mahomes will tell you all about what he learned from Alex Smith. Okay. They didn't score a touchdown in that playoff loss year one. I'm thinking maybe if Mahomes would have started playing by week 10, he would have maybe been able to put up a little bit more points against the Titans that year. So I just, I just fail and refuse to believe that the Packers have some sort of secret sauce at developing quarterbacks even though they are trying desperately to prove me wrong. But I think that Caleb is just an otherworldly talent compared to Jordan Love. And Matt LaFleur seems to be really damn good at this. And Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the ceiling on Jordan Love is significantly lower than it is on Caleb and that we've seen Jordan Love be close to proof of concept, like close to the ceiling because he is smart, because he knows the system, because Mm -hmm. he had that time, because he has the good coaching. I'm sure he'll get better. Everybody gets better. That offense will get older and more mature and more into their prime. But I do think Caleb's natural talent is significantly higher. A lot of cope in that answer. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> do you disagree? I don't think that Jordan Love is at a ceiling. I'm, I, I, I think. I, 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 I think that, so. What? 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 I think you mentioned, like Mahomes playing Week Ten or whatever, and I, I've heard, I've asked people in Kansas City, would that have mattered? They said he would have made mistakes his rookie year it would have been a little rougher we would have seen the potential i think that's mostly true for for any good quarterback sits here what i think happens if you are matt lafleur and you sit with jordan love for three years the floor races i do think the floor races i think we we didn't see a lot of mistakes i think we would have seen a pretty 
reading the tea leaves, I think we would have seen some rough play from Jordan Love his rookie year. He was raw. He didn't have great numbers in college. And then I, LaFleur basically got him got him ready to play. I mean, it was one of the best coaching jobs I've seen in a long time. Aaron Rodgers got him ready to play. Aaron Rodgers helped him. But I don't think he's at a ceiling because he just hasn't played that much football. And he was playing his best football at the end of this season. Those throws against uh, Dallas, uh, those throws even against San Francisco that he was making were like, like I was going to say NFL throws. We, we Obviously, they're NFL throws, but like elite caliber NFL throws. I think he's getting better. I'm not saying Caleb Williams can't catch him in three years. But what I am saying is, is I, I think the floor was high because of, of him sitting. But I also think that the ceiling has yet to be touched. I'm sorry to say. No, you're listen, you're obviously overwhelmingly likely to be correct. I think that athletes, get, <laughs> you know what I mean? I think athletes get better as they play more. I mean, Michael Jordan added a back to the basket game when the the airness and the flying ability eroded him. So obviously I I part of that is tongue in cheek. I do think it'll get better. But also, isn't it just a little sickening? I mean, the guy looked exactly no. like Aaron Rodgers with the ball fakes but, and keeping the ball but, down for the no, hip. He, I, I, he, yes, he very learned, annoying. He, he, he learned a lot about that, but also Lafleur. So the one thing about Lafleur is that he took a lot of the concepts that Aaron Rodgers was familiar with of Mike McCarthy and he married them to the Shanahan McVay Lafleur scheme. And I was anticipating a new type of offense. It's more without Rodgers, less McCarthy, more Lafleur centric. And what it turned out, especially in the first few weeks of the season, when they were really trying to scheme it up was that LaFleur's offense is everything, like everything. They were doing a kitchen sink offense, which I was really impressed by. They really opened up the playbook. He's a really damn good coach. And so if Jordan Love can make those throws, I mean, LaFleur was on the show a couple weeks ago. We were talking about it. If he can make those throws in the face of pressure, in the face of NFL seven-man fronts are just coming at him, including Dallas, which has Micah Parsons, who's, by the way, really good. Don't believe the aggregators who keep saying for some reason that Dallas is tired of him. It's not true. Dallas likes having him on the team. They should. He's, He's good. Little, yeah. I can confirm. Um, I, yeah, great. The Bears would love to have Micah Parsons if uh, if, if if the aggregators are right and 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 that, that they're tired of picked him. One, anyway, picked one spot um, after Justin Fields, by the way. Yeah. Um, he's going to keep – I think Love's going to keep getting better. And I, I know Bears fans don't want to hear that, but I, I really do think that the ceiling has not been touched. Well, and that's why, listen, the, the NFC North is the Lions have the best roster, the Bears – have the best quarterback prospect coming into a really damn good roster. And the Packers and Vikings have damn good coaches. Damn good coaches. And exactly the type of coaches that I would want, that the league seems to value, the the modern system, great play callers, offensive guys, young guys who seemingly can get the most out of whatever caliber of quarterback talent you put in there. I covered Andy Reid for years in Kansas City when I was there. I would call him a quarterback maximizer. Like, whatever you give him, oh, it's Kevin Cobb? He'll have the best season of his career with Andy Reid. You give him Donovan McNabb, you give him Mike Vick, whomever you give, Jeff Garcia, whoever it is, he's going to get the best out of him. And then you give him Patrick Mahomes, and it's MVPs and Super Bowls and records and dynasties. So. Maybe Matt LaFleur is like that, and he's a quarterback maximizer, and whatever Jordan Love's 99th percentile range is as a player, he's going to get him there. I think that's definitely on the board. It's also maybe an argument to not have Matty Rufus as your head coach, yeah, but exactly. let's not do that again. Exactly. I'm going to rank I'm gonna rank the divisions real quick. AFC North is number one. Yeah. NFC North is probably number two going into this year. NFC West, probably number three. AFC East, probably number four. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of respect. That's a lot of respect. Is that, is that because of the ceiling of the best teams or the depth of the four teams? I think it's the depth. I think it's, can you, who, who, how many teams can win the division? How many teams in the division can compete for a Super Bowl? Um, Which I think, I mean, I, I really do believe that there's probably, I mean, in the AFC North, I and mean, we have to see what the hell is going on with Russell Wilson. We have to see what's going on with Justin Fields. We have to see what's going on. Is Deshaun Watson a net positive yet in in Cleveland with that defense? They still have, they're they're adding skill pieces. There's a lot there. I think it's a combination. I think it, it, it's a mixture. I think it's a combination of who who can actually compete for for a conference title. Who can you lose to on a weekly basis? 
Um, are there gimmies in the division? I don't see ones in either of uh, the AFC North or the NFC North. I want to ask about the last team we haven't talked about in the NFC North, which is the Vikings. Do you care that they're trying to move up? Does it scare you? If every Bears fan has PTSD over we we drafted this guy, not this guy, does it not scare you that the Vikings are trying to move to three for a Drake May? Sounds like Jane Daniels go number two. Maybe JJ McCarthy if they get into four. Like, does that scare you that there's another team in the division trying to get a franchise quarterback? Of course. With a good with a good supporting cast. With, with a good supporting that's cast. That's the part of it, right? And they're not a bad organization. It's a very good coach with a very good supporting cast. Of course, that scares me, but I really like this role reversal. Because usually it's the Bears. I mean, taking <laughs> taking Justin Fields as the yeah. fourth quarterback in that class and trading a ton of assets to go up and get him. J.J. McCarthy is the classic Bears draft pick. Yes. The classic Bears draft pick. Absolutely. And so I, I just, I am, of course, I'm a little snake bit like everybody. I'm a little uncomfortable with the prospect. And I fully admit that as great of a situation as Caleb is walking into, the biggest thing is the head coach and there's huge questions here and there are not there for say it's JJ McCarthy, Drake May, whomever. Uh, But talent has a tendency to win out. You know, it took Josh Allen a minute, but it's worked out. They wasted Justin Herbert's rookie contract in, in LA with dysfunction and injuries and coaching changes and system changes, whatever. But we knew from day one that Herbert was that dude. There's no question Mm -hmm. about it. And so maybe that's going to be the case here. And it will, I'll be proven right that they should have fired Eberflus and reset the clock and had a coach and a quarterback on the same timeline. But I got to believe that if Caleb's talent is what everybody says it is and what the numbers and the eye test say it is, that that will win out. And it just might take us a little bit longer to get there here in Chicago. Any um, last thing before before we get you out of here, any, leanings and what Shane Waldron, the new offensive coordinator, is going to do with Caleb Williams. Is he going to try to borrow heavily from Uf- USC? I almost said UFC. Hopefully you don't borrow heavily from UFC. Um, borrow heavily from USC. Try to get him into the the scheme he ran in Seattle, more Shanahan, McVay type of stuff. Like, Do we know what this is going to look like? We don't, um, but we have a little bit. I think, I think the ninth pick could be interesting. Like if they draft another receiver – and Seattle draft Jackson Smith and Jigba with the 15th pick when they already had mm-hmm. Metcalf and Lockett. I think that is interesting. They signed Gerald Everett to pair with Cole Komet. You know, they ran a lot of 12 and 13 personnel. There are multiple tight ends on the field in Seattle. So I think that is a is a tell. I Generally speaking, I don't believe that the majority of coaches bend the mission to the troops. They try to fit the mm-hmm. troops into their mission. And I wish that wasn't the case, but I've talked to enough football people who say, you know, it's really, really hard to do that. Most people are not Andy Reid. Uh, and so my assumption is that Shane Waldron will do his version of the McVay system and what he ran in Seattle and try to put his guys into that situation. That's my assumption as to what we're going to see, but we don't know that yet. I just think it's really hard for a coach to have a flexible mind. Like, yes. like, and this is not a Waldron thing. It's going off what you – like, okay, you spend all of this time developing a system and a playbook, and then it's like, hey, all of those things you had, they're out the window. And that's why I think, like, even, like, the Shanahan's taking what RG3 did at Baylor and incorporating it, like, that stuff is hard to do, even even with the full offseason and installing it. And then all of a sudden, like, one of the things – and I, I don't want to go on a tangent here, but, like, I remember – talking to Rich Gannon about this years ago, about the older quarterbacks and the advantage of the Drew Brees and Tom Brady and, and Peyton Manning had. And part of it was that they ran the same system for like 20 years and they were able to just go back in time and talk to Rob Gronkowski and say, Hey, we're just going to run this play. We did in 2013. Let's just do it. And the offensive line, they would all fall in. And so like, if you're overhauling the offensive system, whether that's for the quarterback, whether that's for skill guys, whether it's in whatever, like there's a lot of institutional knowledge that's going by the wayside. So th- there's, there's always, downsides to, to overhauling things but like all, all of this to say is that um most coaches are bad <laughs> yeah yeah most coaches are bad at least shane waldron and caleb are coming in together so it's they're not going to be biased like, yes. well we don't want to change this because the offensive linemen right. or right, the right, receivers right. or whatever right. you know at, at, le- at least they're coming in together um most people seem to say that shane waldron is a very smart guy, but he's kind of awkward. He's not the greatest deliverer mm. of information. He's not really head coaching material. 
uh, but that he's really, really smart. And so hopefully he can be really, really smart and Caleb Williams can be swaggy and compelling and charismatic enough for the both of them. Tell us about your book. Oh, thanks, man. That's super kind. Uh, it's out today. Uh, Pipeline to the Pros, How D3 Small College Nobodies Rose to Rule the NBA, forward by Jeff Van Gundy, endorsed by Adrian Wojnarowski and others. Um, right now, we know 12 teams that are in the NBA playoffs, right? The top six in each conference. Sure, of course. Five of the 12, their top basketball decision maker, president or GM, former D3 player. Three of the 12 head coaches, former D3 player. This book is about the network of how that happened. How did Jeff Van Gundy break down the door, get in, and start hiring a bunch of people that he knows? Sam Presti, hmm. Greg Popovich, Brad Stevens, um, dating back to guys like Norm Sanju and Carl Shear, uh, going down to the G League and assistants. It tells the story of NBA history through these people. It is a management primer, a story of networking, uh, a testament for a liberal arts education, and much more. I think people would really enjoy it. And a portion of every book goes to brain cancer research in honor of my brother, Brad. Oh, beautiful. Danny Parkins, thank you so much for coming on this football. We'll talk to you soon, man. Thank you, Kevin Clark. You're the best, man. 